J. The Fall. The consciousness of a fall which has brought man down to a level of existence different from that for which he feels he was formed is not exclusively a part of the Judeo-Christian tradition. All peoples have this consciousness which is expressed in myths and symbols in almost every religion. This consciousness has inspired serious speculative turns in many philosophical systems. But nevertheless for the Christian tradition the reference to the fall of man is not simply a particular twist to its anthropological theorizing, but the axis or key to understanding man, the world, and history. On the one side the truth of the fall and on the other the truth of the deification of man define the fact of the church itself and give meaning to its existence and its historical mission. The church's teaching on the theme of the fall is drawn chiefly from the interpretation of the texts of the Old Testament. The narrative of the creation of man in the first pages of the book of Genesis is completed by reference to the event of the fall, with an imagery astonishing in its wealth of meaning and with unrepeatable archetypical symbolism. We read in the book of Genesis that God, when he had created man, planted a garden for his pleasure, a most beautiful garden in Eden, and settled him there. The image of the garden in all Middle Eastern religions functions as a symbol of ideal happiness perhaps in contrast with the aridity and the bareness of the deserts which abound in these regions. Certainly, the drought of the desert is a symbol of death, while the rivers which irrigate the Garden of Eden and the wealth of vegetation which adorn it give a picture of fullness of life. Within this garden of luxury, as the scripture characterizes it, God places the first formed man to work it and keep it, Gen 2.15. Work in this first phase of human life is not labor or slavery to the need for physical survival but the organic continuation and extension of the creative work of God, the flowering of the creativity which characterizes man as an image of God, as a person. At the same time, all the fruit of the plants in paradise are offered to man by God for food, Gen 1.29. Man's life of paradise does not represent a spiritualized condition or idealistic exaltation, as the moralists often imagine. Man's life, from the first moment, is realized by taking nourishment, the immediate use of the stuff of the world. Man lives and exists only in a direct and organic relationship with the world, with the stuff of the world. It is not an intellectual and theoretical relationship, man is not simply a spectator and observer or the interpreter of the world, but he is the one who employs the world directly as nourishment, takes it into himself and makes it his body. Only thus, only with this organic communion with the world is human life realized. The extraordinary thing in man's state of paradise is that this taking of nourishment, which assures man his life, constitutes not only a practical relationship and communion with the world, but also a practical and vital relationship with God. God is the one who provides man his nourishment, the presupposition of life. He offers him every fruit and seed as food. Every taking of food is a gift of God, a blessing of God, a realization of relationship with him a realization of life as relationship. Man's relationship with God in paradise is not an ethical or religious relationship, which means that it is not realized indirectly by the keeping of some law or by offering of prayers and sacrifices. It is man's life itself which is realized as a relationship and communion with God, the direct realization of life by the taking of nourishment, food, and drink. We find the same truth of the first pages of Genesis in the ecclesial action of the Eucharist, where the relationship of man with God as it has been restored as a relationship of life in the flesh of Christ is realized again universally within an event of eating and drinking, man again takes his nourishment the basic forms of nourishment which are bread and wine as an event of communion of a now hypostatically divine human communion, body and blood of Christ. The Holy Communion, the communion of man with God, is again a relationship of life by means of nourishment. Man does not draw his life from nourishment by itself, but from nourishment as a relationship and communion with God. He takes his nourishment as a gift of life which God offers to him, he draws life and existence from the event of communion with him and not from the ability of his nature to survive fleetingly by means of nutrition. But this change of the mode of existence surpasses, however, the physical act of eating and drinking. Participation in the way of the kingdom is not a passage to some other life, but making this life itself incorruptible, this life which is realized as a communion of nourishment. Therefore the image of the kingdom of God in the New Testament is often a picture of a dinner where people eat and drink at the table which God has set for them, LK 2230. God offered to the first formed people the possibility of life, of real life, of incorruptibility, and immortality, giving them the world, nourishment, as an event of communion with him. But the realization of life as communion and relationship is nevertheless a fruit of freedom there is no necessary or compulsory communion or relationship of love. This means that the life of paradise of those first formed people included even the possibility of a different use of freedom, the possibility for human existence to be realized, not as an event of communion and relationship with God, but to be realized by itself alone, drawing existential strength from itself, from its created nature alone. This possibility is expressively portrayed in the biblical narrative by using the symbol of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Gen 2 9, 17. This too is a tree of paradise, but it is not included in the blessing which God offered to man the eating of its fruit does not constitute fellowship and relationship with God. It represents precisely the possibility for man to take his nourishment to realize his life not as communion with God, but unrelated to and independent of God, to feed himself only for his own preservation, for the survival of his physical individuality, for man to exist not as a person, drawing an hypostasis of life from the communion of love, but to exist as a physical individual, as an existential unit which draws the survival of its hypostasis from its own powers, its created energies and functions. God asks the first formed people not to eat a fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Can it be that he wishes to exclude them from the knowledge of ethical dilemmas, to keep them morally unidimensional? We must discern here that the terms good and evil do not have the conventional content of good and bad as we understand them today. They are not categories of conduct, 
they do not express a legal conception of socially useful and socially harmful. Here, as throughout the Holy Scripture, the terms good and evil show the possibility of life and the alienation from life which is the possibility of death. God makes this clear to these first formed people and warns them, the day in which you eat from it, you will surely die, Gen 2:17. In these words of God, we do not have a threat of punishment, but a forecast and warning. If these first people eat from this tree, they do not simply make a mistake, they do not transgress some command which must be kept because it is given from above. Eating the fruit of this tree will remove the presuppositions of life and lead them to death. They will have tried to realize life, not in the way which constitutes life, the triadic way of love and communion, but completely the opposite, by seeking to draw life from the created and therefore ephemeral capacities of their natural individuality, to exist as if each physical individual has its cause and its end in itself. Good and evil do not constitute here a simply conceptual antithesis evil is not the open refutation of good, but its counterfeit and perversion. There is a good and an evil way to realize life, this is the dilemma which is posed for the first formed people. The evil way advances the possibility of living from oneself, the possibility for the created thing to contain both its cause and its goal, to attain by itself, that is, equality with God and to divinize itself. But this is a lie, a false pursuit, which accepts as life the denial of life and leads undeterred to death. In the biblical picture, God wishes to dissuade man from precisely this knowledge of death because death is a definitive knowledge and, once it is attained, it is too late to hold back its tragic consequences. But the first people chose finally the way of evil, the way of death. The warning which God directed to them underlines in the biblical narrative that their choice is made with full awareness of its consequences. However, there intervened a certain extenuating circumstance, in their decision they were influenced by the snake, the archetypical symbol of evil. In ecclesial hermeneutics, the snake here is an expression of the intervention of the devil or Satan, who constitutes a personal existence, spiritual, similar to the angels of God, the ministering spirits that God created before the world. The devil, though, is an existence in revolt, excluded from life, self-condemned to perpetuate the death which he first of all freely chose. The snake directs his challenge firstly to the woman. And here the symbolism is not accidental. In the language of archetypes of life which the scripture uses, the language of archetypical images which signify much more than concepts, the woman is the image of nature, in contradistinction to the man who is the symbol of the essential principle, logos. This contrast of nature and essential principle, feminine and masculine, does not represent an evaluative distinction, but portrays the experience which man has of the way in which physical life is realized, nature has a feminine readiness to incarnate the event of life, but it needs the seed of the essential principle in order that this incarnation be realized. Without the pairing of masculine and feminine, life cannot exist. Without the intervention of the constitutive principle, nature is only a potential, not an existential event. And without its incarnation in nature, the existential principle is just an abstract concept, without substance. And so the temptation to pervert the realization of life, precisely because it constitutes not only a theoretical challenge but a physical possibility, is accepted initially by the woman. The words which the snake addresses to her are frankly the logical imitation of the good unfeignedly a principle which wants to deceive nature, to falsify the possibilities of life, what is this that God has said to you? Not to eat from any tree of paradise. The woman reacts, we can eat from the fruit of the trees of paradise, but from the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden God has said not to eat, lest we die. The snake does not persist in rough approaches, he gives up immediately and takes another approach, you will not die, he says, because God knows that the day that you eat from this tree, your eyes will open and you will become like God's knowing good from evil. The biblical picture does not proceed further. The woman yields to the second temptation to equality with God and self-deification nature agrees to attempt to have its life from itself. The first people taste the fruit of autonomy and existential self-sufficiency. K. Okay. Consequences of the fall, nakedness. And so the fall of man is complete. We speak of a fall in order to show not a simply evaluative derivation, but a change in the mode of existence, a decline from life. The biblical narrative portrays this existential change, the consequences of the fall in unrepeatable symbols. The sense of nakedness is the first consequence, the eyes of the two of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves and made aprons for themselves, Gen 3 7. Until the time of the fall the two were naked, both Adam and his wife, and they were not ashamed, Gen 2 25. What, then, is the feeling of nakedness, the shame of nakedness which accompanies the fall? It is the awareness that the look of the other which falls on me is not the look of the beloved, of the one who loves me, whom I trust. It is the look of a stranger, he does not look at me with love, but sees me just as an object only of his desire and pleasure. The other's look objectifies me, transforms me into a neutral individual. I feel him taking away my subjectivity, my deepest and unique identity. To feel naked is the rupture of relationship, the revocation of love, the need to protect myself from the threat which the other now constitutes for me. And I defend myself with shame. I dress myself in order to save my subjectivity, to protect myself from the look of the other, not to be transformed into an object at the service of the other's individual pleasure and self-sufficiency. Before the fall the body was wholly an expression and manifestation of personal uniqueness, a dynamic call for communion of life, for self-transcendence and self-offering. Through love. The feeling of nakedness and the shame for nakedness begin from the moment when life ceases to have love in view, and aims only for the self-sufficiency of the individual for individual need, for individual pleasure. Therefore after the fall, 
Nakedness ceases to be shame and is made a movement of ultimate trust and self-offering only in human arrows. In true arrows, the soul veils the body, said Nietzsche, whose obstinate atheism did not always render useless the faculty within him to perceive the truth. And from the other side, a saint, Isaac the Syrian, completes his word, love does not know shame. Love is naturally unabashed and oblivious to her measure. The feeling of nakedness and the shame of nakedness are the clearest manifestation of the change which human nature undergoes in the fall, the image of God imprinted on the nature of man is made obscene and perverted, but without its being destroyed, the image of God which is the personal mode of existence, the mode of the trinity, of the love of persons, of the love which alone can unify the life and will and activity of nature. Personal freedom is subordinated, though never totally, to the individual need for physical self-existence, is made an instinct, an impulse, a relentless passion. And so nature is fragmented, parcelled out in individuals who live each one for himself alone, individuals treacherous to each other and opposed to the claim of life. L. Consequences of the Fall, Guilt A second expressive image for the consequences of the fall in the biblical narrative is the appearance of guilt and the attempt at individual justification. The first people hear the steps of God who is walking in the garden in the early evening and fear overcomes them, so much fear that they hasten to hide from the face of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then God calls Adam, asks him why he is afraid, and Adam attributes the cause of fear to his nakedness. Even before God, Adam now feels naked, he even feels the look of God as stripping him, feels it as an attack on his individuality. God is no longer his intimate, his beloved. The relationship with him is not a bond of love and a source of life. Even God is another, a second existence whose mere presence threatens to eliminate the autonomy of the individual. You have eaten, then, from the fruit of the tree of which I instructed you not to eat, says God. And Adam hastens to shift the responsibility, the woman whom you gave me, he answers, she offered me the fruit and I ate. And when God asks the woman, why did you do it? Her own response is an evasion, the snake deceived me and I ate, Gen 3 8 through 13. The fall which has been accomplished, appears now with the individual self-defense, the transfer of responsibility, the effort for individual justification. If the feeling of nakedness and shame is a manifestation of the loss of the personal character of existence, the feeling of guilt, fear, the attempt to transfer responsibility and to justify oneself individually are manifestations of anxiety over the loss of life, of true life which does not die. It is anxiety in the face of death. We have not reached such a conclusion arbitrarily, but with the standards of the ecclesial method of interpretation of the biblical images. Let us ask ourselves particularly, what does Adam in fact fear when he hides from God? From what does he wish to protect himself when he transfers the responsibility to his wife? Perhaps he is afraid of some external threat. Perhaps he senses some objective danger. But, he has no previous experience of threat and danger. Normally he should be as fearless as the infant who stretches his hand out to grab the fire. The easy answer of the moralists is usually that Adam is afraid because he has violated the command of God and now expects punishment. But the concept of transgression and of punishment is itself an image taken from subsequent experiences of the world after the fall. If we absolutize and see only a single interpretation of Adam's fear, we will leave gaps and create unanswerable questions, how is it possible for Adam to fear God whom he knows only as a passionate lover of man? And a giver of life? If, even after the fall, the love of someone truly in love is ready to forgive and forget every fault of the beloved person, will the love of God fail to attain even these human standards? Is the love of God less than the human love of the true lover, of the affectionate father, of the patient mother? Does God not manage even what he asks from us, that we forgive those who sin against us as many times as they wrong us, up to seventy-seven times? But God is just, the moralists answer, and he must grant justice and punish transgression. But from what do they derive this must to which they subordinate even God? Does there exist, then, some necessity which limits the love of God, limits his freedom? If there is, then God is not God or at least he is not the God that the church knows. A just God, a heavenly police constable who oversees the keeping of the laws of an obligatory even for him justice is just a figment of the imagination of fallen humanity, a projection of its need for a supernatural individual security within the reciprocal treachery of collective coexistence. Whatever tricks of sophistry the moralists may contrive in order to accommodate the love of God to justice, the edifices of their reasoning remain unsound. As a grain of sand cannot counterbalance a great quantity of gold, so in comparison God's use of justice cannot counterbalance his mercy, says Saint Isaac the Syrian. The God of the biblical revelation and of ecclesial experience is not just, do not call God just, for his justice is not manifest in the things concerning you. Where, then, is God's justice? He is good, Christ, says, to the evil and to the impious. M. Consequences of the Fall, the Tragedy of Creation To this fundamental truth, which is the experience and certainty of the Church, many oppose a host of examples from the scripture of punishments which God imposes or promises, the flood which drowned every living existence on the earth except for the Ark of Noah, the fire and brimstone which destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, the plagues of Pharaoh, David who is punished for his sin by the death of Absalom, and in the New Testament the paramount image of the future judgment and retribution, the division of the just and unjust, the threat of hell where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. To these biblical examples, people have added every evil in nature, seeing them as the scourge of God, punishments revealing the wrath of God, earthquakes, floods, epidemics, etc. But the church separates the images of exemplary punishments from the truth which these images reveal. The fall of man is truth, and the fall does not have merely a legal content, 
But as we have tried to say here, it is a distortion of life in which the freedom of man brings down the whole creation since human freedom is the unique possibility for every created thing to realize or not to realize the purpose of its existence. A distortion of life means an alienation and corruption of the laws or ways by which life functions. In all these biblical examples of man's punishment and in all the divine scourges, the church sees the consequences of the alienated function of the laws and ways of life, the consequences of the distancing of creation from real life, the chasm which the rebellion of man has dug between the created and the uncreated. The pedagogical language of scripture, especially of the Old Testament which is directed to a stubborn people, interprets these consequences by the principal image comprehensible to fallen humanity, the image of the wrathful God who punishes transgression. But God is not vengeful, it is just that he respects absolutely the freedom of man and the consequences of this freedom. He does not intervene to remove the most bitter fruits of man's free choice, because then he would remove the truth itself of a human person and the astounding, in fact cosmic, dimensions of this truth. The love of God intervenes only to transform the free self-punishment of man into a salvific education. The culmination of this intervention is the incarnation of God himself, his acceptance in the divine human flesh of Christ of all the consequences of man's rebellion to death on a cross and the transformation of these consequences into a relationship and communion with the Father, that is with eternal life. Thereafter, without the consequences of the fall being eliminated in a way subversive to human freedom, the possibility present in paradise of a choice between life and death is restored to man again, the possibility of converting death into life after the pattern of the second Adam, of Christ, or of persisting in death, in hell which is the evidence of not loving. For the church the fall of Adam, in its cosmic and age-long dimensions which are shocking to the human mind, is a great tragedy revealing the infinite bounds of personal freedom, the universal dimensions of the truth of the person finally, revealing the glory of God, the unceasing majesty of his image, which he has imprinted on human nature. This revelation the church discerns within the tragedy of the fall, a revelation which gives meaning to the whole creation. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in travail until now, Rom 8 19, 22 RSV. The universal adventure which begins in the Garden of Eden is not a failure of God's work. This world of natural catastrophes, of wars, of plagues, of injustice, of crimes, the world full of the groaning of innocent victims, the cries of battered children, literally drunk with blood and tears, this world is nevertheless not a triumph of justice, but it is in the eyes of the faithful a triumph of freedom which wins inch by inch and step by step the journey to deification led by the hand by the love of God. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed among us, because the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the glorious liberty of the children of God, Rom 8 18, 21 RSV. A deification of man and of the world which would not be an event of freedom, this is what the failure of God's work would be. An unfree deification is something as contradictory as a concept of an unfree God, a paradox, life without reason or sense. And consequences of the fall, anxiety before death. Let us return again now to the fear which made Adam hide from God after the fall. We can say that this fear is not the child of a legal guilt. It is not an expectation of punishment. It is the loss of that openness to God of which the scripture speaks, 1 JN 321, the rupture of the relationship with him, the awareness of responsibility for realizing life separated from God, the first experience of existential loneliness which is a first taste of mortality. Adam's fear is agony before death. By very different roads, contemporary psychoanalytic experience is forming the view that the first experience of guilt and anxiety is born in man with the event of his birth, being cut off from the maternal body. If this view is confirmed, then it will not be very far from the biblical image of that first fear of Adam, the first feeling of existing as an individual, even if unconscious, is also the first feeling of mortality, a first experience of a very profound loneliness, that is, the individual's inability to draw life from somewhere other than himself. Within man's nature itself it appears that there exists an instinctive distinction between the way of life and the way of death, a distinction between real life, which is communicated and shared, and the mortal individualization of existence. If this is true, then the primitive fear of Adam is not only an image and symbol but an actuality which marks man in the depths of his soul from the first moment of his coming into the world. The dialogue of God with the first people in Eden ends with the announcement and prophetic description by God of the remaining consequences of the fall. Let us enumerate them. An unbridgeable hostility is fixed between the woman and the snake, between human nature and the devil. The hostility will reach a climax in the person of some descendant of the woman who will crush the serpent's head, the power of the devil, while the snake will hardly succeed in bruising his heel. This descendant of Eve is, for the church, Christ, and this first prediction of his victory over the devil is the scripture's proto-gospel, the first joyful message of man's salvation. The sorrows and the groaning of woman are multiplied, she becomes a sensitive vessel and easily given to suffering. She does not cease to be the bearer of life, but life now is the perpetuation of nature, not of the person. The woman gives birth to her children, then, with much pain because each birth is also a further fragmentation of her body, a fragmentation of nature, an addition of autonomous mortal individuals. Her relationship with her husband, the Eros which reveals the triadic original of life, is transformed into a rupture with her husband your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you, Gen 316 RSV. But the approach of the man to life, his relationship with the earth, with nature, with his nourishment and life will be a ground of pain and ceaseless affliction. The relationship of man with material nature of the world cannot be a personal relationship, a relationship with the principle of God's love which constitutes the world.
the world becomes a neutral object which resists man's effort to subordinate it to the need and desire for his individual survival. The earth brings forth thorns and thistles and man earns his bread by the sweat of his brow, until he himself returns to the impersonal neutrality of the objectified earth for his body to be dissolved in the ground, because you are dust, and to the dust you shall return, Gen 319 RSV. Oh. Consequences of the Fall, the Coats of Skin The narrative of the fall of man in the Holy Scripture ends with his dismissal from the Garden of Pleasure, his exclusion from the Tree of Life, from the possibility of immortality. This tragic result is crowned with an image which reveals the love of God, of a love which succeeds in eliminating the decisive character of the fall, to limit the evil which has been invoked, to relativize the irremediable. It is the image of the coats of skin which has especially drawn the attention of Christian interpreters, and the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins, and clothed them, Gen 321. For ecclesial hermeneutics, the coats of skins with which God clothes the first people, symbolize the biological hypostasis which seals the personal otherness of man. Before the fall, every energy of the biological earthly nature of man exists, is realized and manifested, only as a revelation of the divine image, it constitutes personal otherness, life as loving communion and relationship. After the fall, the hypostasis of the human subject is biological, and the energies of nature, the psychosomatic energies, at the service of life as simply individual survival. Man does not cease to be a person, an image of God, it is only that this image is clothed now with the coat of skin of absurdity, corruption, and mortality. But this clothing with corruption and death proves to be a very great philanthropy of God and providence of his love. By dressing the human person with a biological hypostasis, God tolerates the consequence of the fall, the physical, psychosomatic, energies do not hypostasize the personal otherness of life as love, but the mortal individuality and its ephemeral life. By permitting even death as a consequence of this clothing, God limits man precisely to his biological individuality, placing a limit and end to sin, the failure of life and corruption, lest evil become immortal. And so death removes not man himself but the corruption which surround him. It does not touch the human person whom God called into being, it removes and abolishes the false hypostasis of life, the biological individuality which man has put on with the fall. Death, a result of sin, is turned against the phenomenological triumph of sin autonomous biological individuality and abolishes it. Death annuls the covering of corruption, freeing the existential possibilities of the human person. The road, then, remains open after the fall for the person of man to become once more in hypostasis of life, no longer of a biological life, corruptible and temporary, but of an incorruptible and immortal life. This new existential possibility God inaugurates himself with his incarnation, becoming the beginning of salvation and renewal of the human race.